Um, welcome. Thank you for coming to another one of our DEC lectures. Um, as you know, in DEC, we made a point of inviting all women speakers to our lecture series uh, this last year and this year. And these are a set of brilliant women who are making path-breaking contributions to economics and development. So I am today very happy to be continuing our series with Nancy Chen. Um, Nancy is the James Connor Professor of Managerial Economics uh, at the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. Her research focuses on demography, geography, and institutions and development. Uh, she is also a very well-known expert on Chinese economy. Uh, today, her talk is very interesting. We've been talking about it before the talk. Um, so she's going to tell us about missing women in China, uh, determinants as well as consequences of this phenomenon. So please. Thanks so much for uh, having me. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I have two mics, so one of them, as long as one of them works. So thanks so much for having me uh, and giving me this opportunity to talk about some of my work. Um, I'm going to talk about missing women in China, which I've been working on for the last decade or so. And um, let's get started. So you know. Gender, you know, missing women falls under the broad umbrella of gender discrimination. Gender discrimination, as you all know, can manifest in many different ways. The most common way that it manifests is in things like wages, right? The gender wage gap. And we see that in countries of all income levels across the world. Now, in developing countries like China and India and others, gender discrimination can manifest in much more extreme forms. When what I'm talking about is the differential treatment of boys and girls or men and women. Well, differential treatment, differential neglect can actually lead to differential mortality rates. And when that happens, when uh, we have fewer women than men in the population, and we call that missing women. So I should be more precise. It's not just about differential mortality. There is also sex-selective abortion, right? Literally, what we mean by missing women is that there are women that we think should exist in the population, but they don't. And the question is, where are they, and why aren't they there? So this phrase was first coined by Amartya Sen um, many years ago. And then since then, it's been studied a lot by demographers, economists, and social scientists, many of whom are at the World Bank, probably in this room. Okay, so just in terms of numbers, the largest number of missing women are in China and India. Now, what does that mean? China has one of the most skewed population sex ratios in the world. Um, in China, missing women typically happens at very young ages. So in other countries, you can also have sex imbalances at older ages. But in China, this is really a young child phenomenon, right? We see it mostly for children under two. And so, for example, at the turn of uh, our millennia, 61% of all children under age two were boys. So this is a huge skew, right? If we look at OECD countries, on average, it's 51%. So we're talking about a 10%, uh, 10 percentage point difference um, of children in a country with a population of 1.3 billion. So this is a lot of people. Um, over time, we don't really see it getting better. If anything, it gets the problems getting worse. In 2014, we see that there are 33 million more men than women in the population. So to give you a sense, you know, whenever we talk about China and India, we get used to really big numbers. Everything happens in millions, and we stop being impressed, right? But I think it's kind of important to, uh, to get a sense of scale. So how many are 33 million? I looked up, on, I looked up the population of DC on Wikipedia this morning, and uh, DC only has around 609,000 people. So if I add up all of the population, all genders, all ages of Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, and New York State, not New York City, then I get to about 33 million, right? So think about all of these people just vanishing. Uh, this is what we're talking about when we talk about how many missing women there are in China. Okay. 
Now, the most stand, one of the most common ways of looking at missing women in the data is to look at sex ratios at birth. Uh, these data are taken from the World Bank database, and the red line is for China. So what you see is that sex ratios at birth seem very constant before the early 80s, and then it just increases. So this is the number of boys born for every girl. It kind of goes up, 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 up until the 2000s, and then there's some data interpolation going on, but it's still pretty high. When you look at the blue line, it's the same data for the U.S. It's pretty constant and much lower over time. Now, there's two caveats from this figure. One is that because of the one-child policy and family planning, there is an underreporting of births. So we also want to look at survivors later, not just sex ratios at birth. But no amount of correction will change the fact that uh, the sex imbalance is increasing and increasing and increasing. The second thing we just want to note is that the sex ratio at birth data for the early, um, I don't know, I don't think you can see. I'm pointing to the computer. Do you see it? No, it's okay. It doesn't matter. So I think uh, what I was going to say is that you see that the sex ratios at birth in the 60s, 70s, it's like a flat line for China. There's no movement at all. So we think the data for sex ratios at birth in those early years aren't great. But again, no amount of data correction is going to overturn the fact that, sex ratio, that the sex imbalance for young children was low and then increased and then increased and then increased. Okay. So now let's look at survivors. So here I'm looking at three population censuses in 1982, 1990, and 2000. And on the y-axis, I have fraction of males, uh, which is the same idea as sex ratios at birth. The more boys there are relative to girls, the higher this number will be. And on the x-axis, I have birth years. And what you see is that in every single population census, I have an increase across birth years in the fraction of males. It's gradual in the beginning, in the 70s and 80s, and then it really picks up in the late 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And so this is survivors, right? So this is the, ch the girls that were never born and the girls who were born and died. It's all lumped together because this is who's surviving by the time we observe them in the census. And why is it important to look at three censuses? Well, if we only saw one cross-section, we wouldn't really know if there were changes in sex ratios over time, like across birth cohorts, or if there were age-specific mortality rates that varied by gender. OK, so another way of looking at the data, and now I'm just looking at two population censuses, 1990 and 1982 from China. Um, I'm, I just reorganize the data a little bit. The y-axis is still fraction of males. The x-axis is now how old they are in the census year. And when you compare the red line, which is 1990, this is like the 1990 snapshot, to the blue line, which is a 1982 snapshot, what you see is that for every age under 14, there are more boys in 1990 in the red line than 1982 in the blue line, right? And so for every age group under 14, there are more boys in 1990. And if we work back, you know, if we just do some simple arithmetic, if you're 14 in 1990, then you're born in 1976. So basically, we see that the sex imbalance is starting to increase pretty dramatically around 1976. And just for comparison, in the gray line, I plot the 1990 U.S. Census. And here is, I think, a fact that very few people have really um, pointed out for China. 1982 Chinese demographics look remarkably similar to the U.S. It really changes later, right? So I'm going to talk about missing women. We're going to talk about culture. But I just want you to keep in mind that on some level, this is a recent phenomenon. It's not like missing women has always been in China like for decades and you know for centuries and centuries. This is a, at least what we're talking about now, it's a modern phenomenon. Not just modern, recent. Okay, what are some conventional explanations for missing women? One is culture. And people say, well, you know, China has sun bias, male bias, not just, it doesn't just show up in missing women, it shows up in many, many different places. And we have empirical evidence that male bias affects sex selection. So Abravaya has this really neat paper in the AEJ looking at Chinese and Indian immigrants in the United States. And he shows that they have very similar patterns of sex ratios at birth as the home countries, right? So the economic and policy conditions are really different in the US and China and India, but Chinese and Indian 
immigrants have the same a similar sex ratio at birth as their home countries. So this is some evidence that culture really matters. But culture by itself can't be the whole explanation because missing women, like I said, in China is a recent phenomenon. Culture doesn't change that fast. Culture didn't just change in 1974. Okay. The second conventional explanation is poverty, right? We don't seem to see missing women in OECD countries. We seem to see it in poor countries more than rich countries. But this by itself also can't be the whole explanation because as China got richer, things didn't get better, things actually got worse. And similarly, we see that sex ratios at birth, be, not just sex ratios at birth, sex imbalance got more and more skewed in countries like Taiwan and um, South Korea as they became richer. So poverty and overall income can't be the only explanation either. A third possibility, it's also economic, is that men provide old age care for parents. Let me rephrase, this is part, part cultural, part economic. So these societies are patrilocal. When women get married, they moved in with the men. Men take care of their parents, men provide money. And so maybe because of this, daughters are less desirable. And related to that, women earn less than men, right? So I rely on my children. I'm less likely to live with my son. On top of that, my daughter earns less. And related to that, maybe if women earn less, they have less bargaining power. And then if we think men and women have different preferences for boys and girls, giving women uh, less bargaining power may not be so good for missing women either. And related to that, another, one, uh, another explanation that's very important is technology. Over time, our ways of choosing sex have gotten better and cheaper and more, um, and more accurate. And by that specifically, I'm talking about sex-selective abortion. Traditionally, the way to choose sex is differential neglect and fantasize, something that results in differential mortality, which is hard for parents. Uh, over time, people have been able to select early and earlier in utero. And finally, last but not least, uh, since we're talking about China, we have to talk about family planning policies, right? Um, so I'm going to talk about all of these things today. But one thing to keep in mind is that although my first bullet point was that traditionally we say culture and culture can't be the only explanation, a lot of the things, a lot of these other forces don't really matter if there isn't a pre-existing cultural preference for sons. And I'll make that more clear as I go. So what's my point? My point is that a confluence of forces generates missing women in China, specifically patrilineal, patrilocal culture, plus low female wages, low female bargaining power, and sex and differential preferences for boys versus girls from mothers and fathers, family planning policies, sex selective abortion technology. All of these things have interacted over the last 30 years to generate the 33 million missing women that we see in the population in China. And I'm gonna talk about this in more detail today. Okay, why do we care? I don't think, uh, this is probably not necessary for this audience, but I'm gonna say it anyways. It's like, uh, just to make the point. I mean, first of all, there's an ethical and hum humanitarian concern. Right? How do you achieve missing women? Uh, in our context, like I said, is for young ages. You achieve it through sex-selective abortion or differential neglect, or just straight out infanticide that leads to differential mortality rates. So there's a first order humanitarian concern. You know, and then there's spillover effects, spillover effects um, to neighboring countries. So we don't have much empirical evidence on this at the moment, but there's a lot of talk in China and in neighboring countries about trafficking of brides to Chinese um, marriage markets because of a deficit of women. There's concerns that all these single men are causing more crime and political instability. We have evidence that the sex imbalance is affecting savings rates in China. And, um, and finally, there could be really long-run consequences that having such a skewed sex ratio could ch actually change cultural norms. So the evidence on that is also very limited and it's ambivalent, but I just wanted to throw it out there that there are studies showing that having sex ratios, very skewed sex ratios, can change women's bargaining power in the short run and influence cultural norms about women in the long, long run. Long, long run, like three to 500 years. Okay, so what am I gonna talk about today? Um, I'm going to focus on the causes of missing women, and in the next 45 minutes, I will try to cover them all in a chronological order. Um, 
And then after that, I would like to have a speculative discussion about policy implications, right? Speculative, because this is going to the future and we don't have empirical evidence for it yet. But I think given the topic and the audience, this is really important that we have the discussion. And then I'll conclude very quickly. Okay, so let me talk about the causes of missing women in chronological order. Um, I've sort of, I've divided time into four periods, and I'm gonna start with period zero. Period zero is before the 70s. There is cultural male bias, it's always been there, but we don't see sex imbalance in the data. So how do we know that there's male bias? You know, th there's a lot of different ways, but just to keep it brief, I'll stick to missing women. One thing is we see that parents exercise a stopping rule. What does that mean? It means that parents prefer sons, so they're much more likely to stop having children after they have a son than a daughter. If I have a daughter, I'll say, I'm gonna try again. If I have a son, I'm like, okay, I'm very satisfied. Let's stop here. So the interesting thing is, this does not skew the sex ratio. There's this common fallacy that the stopping rule will skew the sex ratio. And I think the minute you think about it, you realize it's not true. So let me just provide an illustrative example. So imagine there are four households, and every time I have a child, the sex is an independent random draw. So at the first, for the first child, half the households have girls, half of them have boys. The ones who have boys say, great, we have a son, let's stop. The ones have girls say, let's try again. When they try again for the second child, half will have girls, half will have boys. So what you see here is that parents in this scenario, they, they are some biased. They, all, they would like to have a son, they're exercising a, um, a sex, a male bias stopping rule, but there's no, um, there's no sex imbalance in this population because at every parity, 50% are boys and 50% are girls. And the point I wanna make here is that in order to get skewed, uh, to get sex imbalance, you have to select either through se sex selective abortion or differential mortality rates, okay. So now let's go to period one. So period one is the early 70s where family planning, when family planning was being introduced, phased in, and we see sex imbalance emerge in the data. So in the beginning, so when we talk about family planning, we typically focus on the one child policy because you know it, it was extreme and it has um, and it's very famous. But actually, it began around a decade before the one child policy with birth spacing in the early 70s, and it was only tightened to the one child policy later. So whenever. Um, Whenever I, study, whenever I study a question in a developing country, I find it really useful to understand the historical and institutional context around it. It helps me interpret the results. So bear with me for one slide of history of family planning in China. So actually, you know, this discussion between should we control population because of Malthusian concerns versus or not started when Ch modern China started in 49. In the, uh, in, in 49. So on the one hand, you had um, economists and demographers like Ma Ying-chu who said, well, you know, we need to control population. And on the other side, there were pro-natalists like, um, like Chairman Mao who said, actually, he, having a lot of people in, is an advantage for China and we should get the Chinese population as big as possible. This is our big comparative advantage relative to other countries. So in the or 50s and 60s, the latter dominated policy and not only was there not family planning, China was pronatal in the sense that you can only have access to contraceptives after a certain number of births. And that number varied between four or six, depending on the time. So people of my parents' age, all of my parents and their friends come from families of exactly four. <laughs> um, so, it was pronatal. And then a sequence of events, including a very devastating famine where 22 to 45 million people died, slowly pushed the government towards population control. And starting in the early 70s, the first set of people dominated, the first view dominated policy. And China switched, very quietly switched to antinatal policies. And in the beginning, what they did was they encouraged birth spacing. They said, you know, try to have children later try not to have more than three, and try to have them three to four years apart. And what we see in the data is that fertility starts to decline gradually. It starts in 70, for the 72 birth cohort. 
And then Grant Miller has a very nice paper showing that a sex imbalance also begins starting in the 72 cohort, right? So it begins, but it's gradual. The one-child policy was then introduced in 79 and 80. In 79, it was introduced in select places such as Shanghai, and in 80, it was rolled out for the whole country. And there are always some exemptions, as many of you know, for groups like ethnic minorities and parents in high-risk employment, like coal mining. But by and large, it was rolled out, and the previous... But the interesting thing to know is that the previous birth spacing policies of four years meant that the one child policy binds for those who are born in 76 in terms of fertility, right? Your parents are waiting four years to have another kid and then the one child policy kicks in. So everyone born in 76 and later will have smaller family size because of the one child policy even though it was introduced four years later. That's just something interesting to, to know. Okay. Immediately after the one child policy was introduced, there were a lot of reports of, uh, of infanticide and uh, a female infanticide and differential neglect, but differential mortality rates. And the government responded very quickly the, by introducing a set of relaxations, specifically in, um, starting around 81 and 82, they introduced a relaxation that allowed families to have, rural families to have a second child if the first was a girl. It was only in rural because in urban areas they were better able to enforce policy that didn't allow, um, th th infanticide was less of an issue in urban areas uh, in these years. So this policy, this relaxation of letting parents have a second child if the first was a girl, this was mostly left to the discretion of local policymakers, right? So local policymakers were told to balance two objectives. One is keep fertility low. The second is, if and when you need, give a relaxation so that we don't have a lot of female infanticide. So, um, so let's first quickly look at the data, just in terms of uh, you know, what happened with the one-child policy and also where these relaxations were targeted or not. So if we look at the 1990 population census, this is a 1% sample, and I divide households into two types, those with only one child, and those with um, up to three children, I see that the sex ratio is very different. For the families with up to three children, the sex ratio is around, uh, there's around 50, around 51.2% per, are boys. So this is, you know, almost the same as OECD countries. But for one child families, 61.1% are boys. So this is very skewed. And then we can ask the question, well, when the government, said, you know, when they introduced these relaxations, were, was the government sincere and were the relaxations well targeted? And we can look at this by seeing if the places that got relaxations were also the place that had a spike in male bias sex ratios right after the introduction of the one child policy. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to regress sex ratios and the interaction of birth year dummy variables and how, many rela how much relaxation there was in your county of birth as reported by the China Health and Nutritional Survey. And basically what this figure shows me, so this is a plot of those interaction coefficients and the 95% confidence intervals. And on the x-axis you see the birth, birth year. And basically what this tells me is that get, the number of relaxations you get in the early 80s is unrelated to sex ratios before um, places that got the relaxations were indeed the ones that had a spike in sex ratios in the early 80s when um, the one-child policy was first rolled out. So what this tells us is that the relaxations in, for trying to curb female infanticide that the government introduced in the early 80s, they seem sincerely implemented. They were sincere and they were targeting correctly. Why is it important? Because what we see afterwards is that despite the sincere effort to target relaxations to curb female infanticide, sex imbalance kept going up anyways. Um, so Avi Ebenstein has a very nice paper show, use, looking at the variations in fines against violations, and he shows that the higher the fines, the more skewed sex imbalance. Lee et al. has a paper that compares Han, who were under the policy, to minorities who got an exemption, and he showed that 
minorities didn't experience a rise in sex ratios. Okay, so what does all this tell us? What we learned is that the introduction of family planning policies increased male bias sex ratios in the early 1970s. The policies tightened and sex ratios became more and more biased in the early 80s. In response, the government sincerely targeted a set of uh, a relaxation to try to curb female infanticide and the, diff uh, and the sex imbalance. It had very limited success and we see sex ratios continue to be more and more biased over time. Okay, so now this takes us to period two, which is the early 80s. It, the, during this period, family planning intensifies, but I won't talk about that since we just, talk, we just spoke about it. But market reforms happen, and the market reforms increase the gender wage gaps. You know, <clears throat> volumes and volumes of books can be written about the reform era and China's switch from China's switch from a centrally planned economy to a more market or oriented economy. So I'm just uh, so I'm going to apologize in advance to those of you who have really studied this topic. I'm going to give an extremely simplified summary of what's going on. Um, before the 1980s, by and large, workers were not paid according to their marginal product, and women received more equal pay uh, than later. After, the 19, after 1978, workers relative to before were more likely to be paid something closer to their marginal product, and we see a gender wage gap increase. So the question we want to ask is, did this increase in gender wage gap contribute to sex ratios? The study I'm going to look at is actually the flip side. I'm going to ask if increasing female, relative female wages will reduce the sex imbalance. Okay. And specifically, and so now I'm in a context of rural China. So most of this, will, so there's no select sex selective abortion. We're really talking about differential mortality rates. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a question, does increasing relative female wages reduce missing women? And in order to study this question, I'm going to use policy reforms and the early reform era for variation in relative female wages. So let me take a step back and talk a little bit about planned agricultural production and procurement because this is important. So in the planned agricultural economy, the, the government categorized all crops into three categories, staples, cash crops, and unregulated. Amongst the cash crops, importantly, there were tea and there were orchards, fruits. In the early reform era, the government said we need to increase production of everything and we need to diversify the composition of production. We're going to do this by incentivizing farmers and giving them freedom. There were two reforms. One is to increase the procurement price of staple crops and cash crops, but the procurement price for cash crops increased disproportionately. It increased a lot more. The second thing the government did is that we're going to give households more discretion in choosing what they produce. They don't have 100% of freedom, but they have a lot of more freedom than before. So this is often called the household production responsibility system. What this meant was that households could now, on the margin, they could choose to produce the thing that you know they had a comparative advantage in producing. Now, let me talk about tea. Uh, tea was a really important cash crop. Uh, I could go on for days about the virtues of tea, but for the purposes of this talk, just know that tea was important, and it was. And women have a comparative advantage in picking it. In China, tea is mostly, not exclusively, but mostly picked by women. Women have small and agile fingers. They can nip the tea leaves at the stem. The bushes are low, so it's easier for women. And they don't break the leaves, so children aren't that great. Um, if you break a tea leaf, it becomes, it wor it's, I shouldn't say worthless, it's worth a lot less money if you break the tea leaf because of over rapid oxidization. Okay. Evidence. <laughs> okay. So, and you can tell how old that is by the low resolution of my photograph. But anyhow, so this is a map of the counties that produce some tea in China. So you see it's pretty spread out, right? China is a very hilly and mountainous country. Basically, tea is being produced in the hilly areas, but there are hills everywhere. Um, so what am I going to do? I'm going to compare sex ratios in counties with tea to counties without before and after the reform that increase the value of tea. Because if I increase the value of tea, I'm increasing the relative value of female labor. 
right? And I want to know what happens to sex ratios when I increase the relative value of female labor. The main conceptual problem I have is that when I increase the price of tea and uh, an income from tea and income from women, I'm increasing total household income as well, right? And what I really want to know, I really want to disentangle the effect of just the total income effect from a relative female income effect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do another exp natural experiment and look at orchards. It turns out that men have a comparative advantage in producing orchards. The trees are tall. It takes a lot of work to dig holes and plant a tree. Um, I tried I tried all of these activities to see if it was really difficult. Um, and I did find, not that this isn't rigorous empirical evidence, but I did find it easier to pick tea leaves than to pick fruit or to plant a tree. Um, anyhow, so I'm going to repeat the natural experiment and compare sex ratios in counties that can cultivate orchards to counties that can't before and after the reform that increased the value of orchard fruits, which, which, um, which increased the value of male labor, right? So if it's about a total income effect, then the sign for the tea and orchard experiments should be the same. If it's about relative income effects, they should be different. And you know, as just to, just to play it safe, we can also look at gender neutral cash crops, where men and women are not known to have any advantage one way or the other, but we also know that the price has increased because of this reform. Okay, so this is just to show you the increase in income. So the price increases, cause increases in income from orchards and tea. Tea is green, orchard is red. After the reform, staple crops is blue. So there's a small bump, um, but less than the cash crops. Now, these are really the main results, right? These are just descriptive statistics. On the y-axis, I have fraction of males. On the x-axis, I have birth years. I've divided the data. I've divided counties in China and to those that can cultivate tea, that have ever cultivated tea, to those that have never cultivated tea, I calculate the average fraction, the fraction of males for each birth year averaged across all the counties that can cultivate tea, so that's the green line, and all the counties that can't cultivate tea, and that's the black line. And what you see is that to the left of the vertical line, this is before the reform, the green line is higher than the black line. So there are actually more boys from every single birth cohort that have survived up until 1990 in tea counties and non-tea counties before the reform. After the reform, they switch. After the reform that increased the value of tea and female labor, we see that now there are more girls, there are fewer boys, right? Fewer boys means more girls in tea counties than non-tea counties. So after this, I'm going to show you regression estimates, but the regression estimates are simply going to be the, diff the vertical gap between these two lines for every single birth year. And so the, the green line, these are the regression estimates. And the red line is the same thing for orchard producing counties. And what this line shows us is that before the reform that changed the relative prices of these crops, the fraction of males were very similar between counties that could produce orchards and counties that could produce tea. After the reform, we see a divergence. There are more boys in the red line. There are more boys in counties that produce orchards and less boys slash more girls in counties that produce tea. So this is telling that us that when we increase the relative female wage, we have more girls survive. When we increase the relative male wage, we have more boys survive. And then just to be complete, we can do this with gender neutral cash crops and what we see, or staple crops, right? So these crops are not known to have um, a gender advantage and we see nothing, right? So there's no, uh, there's no change in survival and relative survival rates between boys and girls um, after the reform. Okay, so... In terms of magnitude, we want to ask how important are the inc are increasing gender wage gaps to the rising sex imbalance during the during the early period, 78 to 84. If I take the estimates completely literally and linearly interpolate, then and I apply it to the actual gender wage gap we see in China during this time, then these estimates tell me that the gender wage gap during this time explains 100% of the rise in sex imbalance during this time. Okay, so that's, 
very impressive, but of course we don't actually want to take it literally, right? Because we don't actually think that the elasticity of missing women with respect to relative female wages is linear. And what I mean is that in a world where wages are really different and there's a lot of sex imbalance, if I give an additional dollar to the woman, there might be a big effect. Once things are pretty close to equal, and I give them like the one thousandth dollar, we don't expect that to have the same effect as the first dollar. So we don't actually want to do this linear interpretation. It's useful as a sanity check, but we don't take it literally. I think the only thing we take away is that gender, gender, the gender wage gap, is an important contributor to the um, to sex imbalance. But there's room for other explanations. Now. One thing, I, another thing I want to talk about is mechanisms and policy implications. So the reduced form results so far, the results I showed you are actually consistent with me different mechanisms, and they have different, very different policy implications. So one is the investment motive. For example, you know, why why do I desire girls more now that adult women are more? So one possibility is that now that mothers are earning more or adult women are earning more, I think that my daughter, when she grows up in you know, 15, 20 years, will earn more. And because of that, daughters have become more valuable to me than sons. So I'm, going to, I'm more willing to have daughters. If you think that's the mechanism, then the policy for reducing missing women is to increase the returns of having daughters, increase, just to increase female wages, um, or to subsidize the cost for girls. Okay, a second possibility is that it's not really about the investment value of my daughter, it's about bargaining power, right? Maybe, just maybe, mothers and fathers have different sex preferences. The fathers have stronger male bias preferences than mothers. And again, I'm in a world where everyone like is likely to have some male preference. So we're just saying that mothers have less of it than fathers. And what it really comes down to are these different preferences and bargaining power. When I increase the mother's wage, I increase her bargaining power in the household. I increase how much say she has at home. So because she has less some preference than fathers, when I increase how much power she has at home, we see girls survive more, more girls being born, girls uh, survive more. If that's what we think is going on, then the policy for reducing, um, for reducing missing women should focus on the mother. We should just increase female wages or do what we can to increase her bargaining power. So how do we disentangle these things? Well, we can repeat the same natural experiments looking at school enrollment as an outcome. And what we see is that in T regions, uh, after the price reform that increased the price of tea and increased the value of female labor, education, school enrollment goes up for all children, boys and girls, not only girls, boys and girls, equally actually. When we look at orchard regions where male income and total household income have gone up and men have an increase in their bargaining power, we see that investment in boys and girls, and what I mean is school enrollment for boys and girls, they go down. Actually, for boys, they don't change, and for girls, it goes down. So that's very diff diff difficult to reconcile with any type of investment story, right? So why would you reduce schooling in, uh, in children if it's about investment? And what this tells us then is that behind, you know, what's driving these results is really about a change in bargaining power and the fact that mother, what it's telling us is that mothers and fathers have different preferences for girls versus boys. And when we increase the mother's wage, we're increasing her bargaining power and that's increasing survival rates for girls and schooling for all kids. Okay, so let me just summarize a little bit what we've learned. What we see is that increasing relative female wages reduces missing women and increases education for all kids. Increasing male wages increases missing women and reduces education for, uh, this is a typo, it reduces education for girls and has no effect on boys, right? And what this tells us is that giving women who have different preferences for children more power resources can be effective in improving outcomes for girls and also boys.
So going back to the gender wage gap, remember I'm asking like the reverse of what I really want to ask. What this tells us is that the, the increasing gender wage gap was likely to be a contributor to missing women um, in the 80s. Okay, period three. So period three is the mid 80s, late 80s and early 90s. And to me, this period is characterized by a change in the technology for sex selection. Prior to the 1980s, most selection uh, occurred through differential mortality rates. In the late mid 80s, prenatal sex selection, and what I mean is safe abortion, relatively safe abortion, plus ultrasound B, which allowed you to infer the sex of the fetus, became available. First, it was available in urban areas, and then, you know, starting in the early 90s, everywhere in China. Now, many governments recognize this, and they say, why not just ban sex-selective abortion? And the question I want to ask is, is this obviously good for girls? So in a paper with two co-authors from Taiwan, we asked two questions. We say, how much does sex-selective abortion affect sex ratios? Like, you know, does it really... Um, uh, is it really contributing to the sex imbalance we observe? And the second question we ask is, will forcing parents to have unwanted girls increase postnatal sex selection? Right? Another way of asking that is, if we legalize sex-selective abortion, does it reduce neonatal female mortality rates? Because that would be an unfortunate, unintended consequence if we just went ahead and banned sex-selective abortion. And so for this study, we use data from Taiwan because the data are much better. And we look at a reform that legalized abortion. So this is in the mid-80s. Um, uh, ultrasound B in Taiwan was already <laughs> available, and it was already widely used to monitor the health of the fetus. But abortion wasn't legal. So when abortion became legal, sex-selective abortion became available to this population. And we argue that it's going to affect parents differently. It's going to have a bigger effect on parents who face a higher cost of having another kid. Right? Like we said earlier, if this is your first kid and you're in for two, and you just want one son, then the first kid, girl, boy, you know, whatever. But if you're in for two and it's your second kid, or if you're in for three and it's your third kid, then you really need to make sure this is a son. So we're going to see if sex ratios increase more for the third and higher parity births after abortion is legalized in Taiwan. And I think it's easiest to see the patterns in the data because they're striking. So we can even call this a descriptive paper. So we, we got the universe of births and death from the vital statistics from Taiwan. We take all of the birth that occurred from 1980 to 1989, and we link them to all the death records uh, up until 1994. So if you die before 19, uh, if you die before you're four years old, I'll see you in this data set. If you're born between 1980 and 1989, I'll see you in the data set. And if you die before age four, I'll see you in the mortality data. And then I break up the data by mother's age, and. So this is, uh, the top left are mothers who are really young, 18 to 22, then 23 to 28, 29 to 34. The bottom right are older mothers, 35 and older. And then for each group of mothers, I break up the birth by parity. So the tiny, tiny dash line are first births. I don't know if you can see it way in the back. The longer dash line, the bigger dash line are second births. But the important one everyone see is a bolded line. This is third and higher parity births. And the vertical red line, that's when sex-selective abortion becomes available. And what we see is that before sex-selective abortion, sex ratios are around 51% uh, around of births are male. And there's not a big difference across parities, birth parities. After sex-selective abortion becomes available, we see a huge increase in the fraction of males that are being born for third and higher parity births. And it's the older the mothers, uh, um, the less noisy, but I wouldn't overinterpret that. Okay, uh, so, sorry. so what we get from this is that indeed the introduction of sex-selective abortion seems to really increase uh, the number of boys being born for a higher parity birth. And in case you're interested, this is a period where Taiwan, uh, where f the average fertility in Taiwan was three, right? So the third is like the last birth on average. 
When I look at mortality rates by parity over time, this is what I see. Again, the solid black line are third and higher parity births. And this is relative mortality between girls and boys. What I see is that before the introduction of sex selective abortion, for those third and higher parity births, more girls died than boys. After the reform, it's the same. So sex selective abortion, the, it's the availability, the ability to select the sex of your third child reduced female mortality rates for the third child. Now, in terms of magnitude, right, how do these numbers add up? So if you, what we find is that sex selective abortion explains 100% of the rise in sex imbalance in Taiwan in the late 80s. This supports evidence from mainland China by a paper by Chen et al. in the JHR, where they look at the introduction of ultrasound across counties in China, and they say that the introduction of ultrasound contributes to around 50% of the rise in sex imbalance in China. So, but the, the really surprising result, I think, or maybe it's not so surprising, is that sex-selective abortion in Taiwan explains 50% of the reduction in relative female neonatal mortality rates. And what's the, this is a really important policy implication. It means that if you ban sex-selective abortion without any other policy to accompany it, you are probably going to lower the overall sex imbalance. If you enforce the ban, you can probably lower it by a lot. But you're probably going to, you might very well increase female mortality, especially for parents with very strong sum preference who face a high cost of an additional child. So remember, if you have family planning, you face a super high cost of an additional child because you're not allowed to have an additional child. And even if you don't have family planning, we have a secular decline in the desired number of children, right? In Taiwan, there is no family planning. People just don't want to have that many kids. So when you hit that last kid, this is, you know, you're going to get some, um, you're very likely to get some nasty unintended consequences. Now, period four. So period four, I'm thinking about the 90s and uh, late 90s and 2000s, when there's an increased reliance on children for old age support. So old age support comes from two places, by and large. One is your children, and the second for urban people in China is the socialist pension system. In the 90s and 2000s, people continued to get their pensions, but the pensions weren't indexed to growth, and China was growing a lot. What that meant was that the pensions became worth less and less in terms of how much people needed to, to live on when they retired, and they needed their children more and more. And remember, daughters earn less than sons in this era. According to the All China Women's Federation, in 2016, women earned 77% of male wages. And then finally, there's this concern of a patrilocal culture. Traditionally, even now, by and large, when you get married, if you live with elder parents, you're going to live with your, uh, you live with your husband's parents. By and large, things are changing, it's not the same everywhere, but by and large, it's a patrilocal culture. So parents are, maybe parents are worried that daughters aren't able to provide them with as much old age support, and hence they find daughters less desirable. This is yet another force. So for this, we only have indirect evidence. Um, and what we observe, so what we do is we take data, we take savings rates in 2008. So parents are in their 50s and early 60s. Their children, this, this is a cohort of parents, whose children were, uh, how, who, whose fertility were affected by family planning. Their children are now grown and no longer living with them. So there's no expenditure on these adult children. And we look to see how the savings rates of those who were forced to only have one child compare with those who were allowed to have two. Basically, they finished having kids before family planning became binding. And we find something really interesting. There is a difference in savings rates, but only if you're stuck with just one daughter. So when we compare people who were forced to only have one child by policy, but that one child is a son, versus and families that have two children, the savings rates are the same. They don't save more, they don't save less. When we compare parents with only one daughter, 
like policy said you can't have any more kids and the first child happened to be a daughter. When we compare them with parents who were allowed to have two kids because they had both before family planning became binding, we see that they save a lot more. more I mean, the savings rate is over 50% higher for these guys. And so to us, this is consistent with the idea that parents are having uh, parents with only daughters save more because they anticipate less old age support, right? And this is consistent with this concern that this the need of children for old age support and the the fact that um, daughters on average will provide less support might make sons even more desirable than daughters on top of all of the other forces that we already talked about. So now, in my last 10 minutes, I would like to talk a little bit about policy implications. So I want to recap a little bit on the causes before we talk about policy. So what we've said so far is in the early 70s, before the 70s, we don't really see sex imbalance in China, despite the cultural norms of being very male and some biased. In the early 70s, we see the, an emergence of sex imbalance along with the emergence of family planning. But this was mostly in, and this was mostly in urban areas. In the late 70s and early 80s, we see an increase in the gender wage gap from market reforms and an increase in sex imbalance. And this is mostly in the rural areas. Because for those of you who aren't familiar with China, the initial phases of market reforms and economic growth happened in the rural areas before it happened in the urban areas, which is what we mostly notice today. Now, in the mid-80s and early 90s, sex-selective abortion interacts dangerously with family planning and a secular decline in desired fertility rates to increase sex imbalance further. First, it happened in urban areas. That's where the technology became available in the late 80s. And then by the 90s, it was everywhere, rural and urban areas. And then as we keep going, in China, you know, as China grows more and more, we have this additional issue that pensions in urban areas aren't keeping up with growth. And parents rely more, they need their children you know, more than before. Right? And we already said women earn less, women live, with their, uh, women live with their husbands' families, so this makes girls less desirable. And then finally, again, you know, just to reiterate, cultural norms of male, bi of male bias is interacting with these economic and policy forces, right? Because a lot of things such as constraining the number of kids from family planning or sex uh, or technology, it's, it's re it really doesn't matter unless if you have a pre-existing bias towards boys. So where does this all leave policymakers? Well, you know, if we think about it, there are, some, there are some readily available policy tools that we can relax family planning, we can increase the cost of sex-selective abortion, we can increase female wages or returns to female education or just subsidize girls. And I want, I'm going to talk about these. And, the thing, um, and another thing that I'm not going to really talk about that's harder to do, but I think it's possible, is also to change, change cultural norms. Actually, I will talk about it in a slide in a little bit, just because I think it's very important. And I see Carla nodding. Um, OK, but here, let me be very frank and honest. This is a speculative discussion. We're looking into the future, so we don't have rigorous evaluations yet. We're using the evidence and the knowledge we have from you know, everybody's work in the literature all together to make a best guess of what policies will do what and how much. Okay, let's talk about the first one. Let's relax family planning. Well, actually the government did this, right? Everyone here knows that two or three years ago, the Chinese government said, let's scrap the one child policy. You can have, everybody can have two kids. At first it was, you know, you can have two kids if you're both only children, but more or less, this means everybody now. Well, I think it's going to have an effect, but the effect will be limited for a couple of reasons. One is, Given the, given the evidence we have from earlier relaxations that were targeted to curb the gender imbalance, my guess is that this is going to reduce sex imbalance for the first child. But for the second child, there's still going to be imbalance if there's a son preference or this view that my life will be better if I have at least one son. Right? 
And the second reason that I think is going to have a limited effect is it's not clear how binding the one-child policy is at this point. In rural areas, fertility rates have been close to two for the last uh, few decades, despite the nominal one-child policy, just because of all the exemptions and maybe lax enforcement. Um, in urban areas, fertility rates are very low and people are waiting very, very late to have their first child. And if you just look at the data, fertility rates or desired fertility in urban China and cities like Shanghai and Beijing look very similar to uh, large cities in Japan. So it's not clear what desire, it's not clear that desired fertility is two anymore. There's a lot of other things happening that might be changing the secular preference for how many kids people want. So these two reasons means that the relaxation will probably have an effect, but that effect might be limited. The second thing we can do is just ban sex-selective abortion, right? So most of selection that we see today is probably not differential mortality like the early periods. Most of it is probably driven by sex-selective abortion. But as we were saying earlier, um, well, this has two difficulties. One is that bans on sex-selective abortion are very hard to enforce. Ultrasound, ultrasound machines are small and mobile these days. It's pretty easy to conduct a safe abortion these days in a middle-income country like China. So it's hard to enforce it very well. And, so, and if, if you can enforce it, as we were saying earlier, you might get really undesirable, unintended consequences, like those parents that really, really, really want to have a son. They might you know, go to the next step and revert back to earlier methods like di that result in differential mortality rates. So if, if we think about banning sex-selective abortion, we will only want to do this in combo with other policies that would make sure that the second thing doesn't happen. Um, the third policy is increased relative female wages or subsidized education for girls. You know, why do we think this work? We see we saw some evidence that increasing female wages would increase the female would increase female bargaining power in the household, which would reduce women and increase investment in all children. And you know, and who doesn't like that? Um, and then you know, it's hard to know the bang for the buck, but on some level. And some level, that's not that important, given the vast literature we have showing the benefits of increasing female bargaining power and increasing resources to women. You know, there's like a lot of benefits in other dimension. But then, you know, maybe I'm biased because I'm a woman and I just want people to give me stuff. Um, so now, this really, really hard question of can culture norms and attitudes be changed? So some people say, no, it's not really worth discussing. It's not worth a discussion amongst policymakers because these are long, slow-moving processes and we don't understand them. But I think we should talk about them because they're so important and anything is possible, right? So, and interestingly, we have these recent studies. There's a job market paper this year by Melanie Xue that uses the cotton textile revolution in Ming, China, to show that this increase in female wages uh, through the cotton revolution for 300 years had long-lasting impacts on attitudes towards women, you know, 300, 500 years later, right? So she shows that this thing that increased female wages for 300 years, and uh, this is 1300, 1300s to the 16 to the 1700s. If you look at these people in the 1900s and like in recent years, there's still higher female labor supply and they have more progressive attitudes about women. So maybe we don't, you can push back and say, well, that's great. Like, that's great, we believe it. But as policymakers, we can't, we don't have a 500 year planning horizon. Even the Chinese government doesn't have a 500 year planning horizon. Actually, I'm sure it does, but I guess the point is that uh, not every policy can be based on a 500-year planning horizon. But I think there's still hope. So recently, there's a really nice paper in the JPE by D Davide Cantoni and co-authors showing that a curricular reform and textbooks in China, this is these are high school textbooks, have affects attitudes several years later, right? 
So I think there, this is an area where we need a lot more research, but I don't think we should be silent. I think as economists, we shouldn't be silent about issues of cultural norms. Okay, so I think I'm on time. Let me conclude. A few concluding remarks. What have, um, what have we learned from the literature, or what have I tried to learn in my work? I think the extreme sex imbalance in China is due to compounding effects coming from policy and economic change interacting with culture. There is a change in desired total fertility um, from just secular change. There is a force change from policy, family planning policy. There is an increase in the gender wage gap in the reform era and a reduction in the cost of sex selection and an increased reliance on children. None of these things are good for missing women. And then I want to point out that you know, even though my talk has exclusively focused on China, it is important to note that missing women is not isolated to the Chinese context. We see it in other countries, in Africa, in India. We see it for other age groups, for older women. And I think um, I'm not going to talk about that. I know that in February, you're going to get, uh, I think Seema's coming to talk, Jen Chaijuan, and she'll talk more about the Indian context. But I just want to point out that the, uh, there are important similarities and differences between China and these other contexts. So one difference, of course, is that we had the superimposed family planning policies. But then there are a lot of similarities, right? The secular decline in desired fertility, the introduction of technology, the gender wage gap, the male bias and patrilocal cultural norms, these are true in most of these other contexts that we're talking about. So we, are, we can get generalizable insights. And finally, back to policy. You know, if we, want to, if we want to fix this issue, I don't want to say fix, it's hard to fix anything. But if we want to make the world a little bit better, what can we do? I think what the literature at this point tells us is that we need bundled, we need well thought out, well designed, bundled policies. We want, we want to consider increasing adult female wages in education, increases, increasing the cost of sex selective abortion, but bundled together with subsidizing girls so that we avoid these unintended mortality consequences. And one thing that could work really well, even though I don't have empirical evidence to show you, is that increasing education about gender equality could start the process a long process, but an important process of just changing these cultural norms about gender. Thank you. Thank you very much. So before the talk, I asked Nancy if she had a chance to discuss with the policymakers in, in China and whether they had exhibited any awareness of the issue and interest in policy recommendations. And she told me she hasn't had the opportunity. So if there is anybody in the audience uh, who has had that opportunity, please do let us know. So why don't we now turn to you for questions, comments, thoughts? And we'll take a couple. Yes, please. Um, thank you, Professor Chen, for this wonderful and thought-provoking um, presentation. Um, um, my uh, question reg uh, is regarding the cost of uh, raising a boy, in, especially in the past decades in China, because, uh, well, um, uh, you know the roaring real estate price here and in our traditional culture, I'm from China, by the way, uh, we expect the bride to pay more for a like wedding house. So. Um, uh, with the rising price of uh, house, especially in urban areas, um, maybe the younger generation of parents will start to like uh, considering the cost of raising a boy. So I'm not sure whether my gut feeling would be supported more or less by a stati statistical evidence. And also, this is the second part of the question, if I'm allowed to ask the second question. Uh, for uh, the younger generation of us, uh, we were born as a one child under the one child policy, and um, perhaps um, our um, so we have less preference over boys than girls uh, because we were raised that way. Uh, so I'm not sure whether um, the bias in, of uh, like children in our generation would be supported by the statistics. Thanks. Let's take a couple. Any other questions, comments? Yes, could you please come to the microphone? 
So uh, I just wanted to hear um, your thoughts on a, on a couple of uh, points. Um, one, uh, you, didn't, uh, uh, you didn't specifically refer to the introduction of the household responsibility system, and there's a recent paper uh, in, in JPE that shows that that could have led to an increase in um, male births post the uh, post introduction of reform. And then the second point I wanted to hear your thoughts on is the case of South Korea, where if you just stick to the sex ratio at births as a statistic, then that's at least one country where we've seen a reversal. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I'd be really interested to hear. Thank you. Sir, I didn't hear the second question. Uh, what are your thoughts on South Korea's experience where the sex ratio at birth actually has gone back, has normalized um, in terms of you know, what worked, what didn't, and what, in terms of the policy messages that you discussed towards the end, which of those you think are at play? Carla. Thank you very much for your talk. I wanted to respond to your comment towards the end that it takes forever to change norms. The experience in India, at least in the state of West Bengal, but more generally based on, let's say, Lakshmi Iyer's work, that experience is that within a very small number of years, um, exposure to a local village chief who is um, a woman because only women get elected in um, a randomly chosen one-third of the villages, changes um, parents' aspirations for their girls, changes how people do on implicit association tests and thinking about girls as just domestic rather than um, in the political sphere. So. Um, it might not be the case that you have to wait forever to change norms. So I'd love it if you talk more about um, any ideas you, you have about changing norms. Okay, let me take one more and then we'll give you a chance to respond. Yes, and then we'll have another round. Yeah. We can't hear you. Hello, yeah. Thank you so very much for the very interesting talk. I have two questions. One is that your very nice presentation shows the change over time and the different period, how this preference of boys change over time and driven by different factors. I'm wondering whether we can look at it also like by rural and urban, as you might you just indicated, the policy for this one-child policy actually varies in urban as well as in rural areas, and all these driving factors probably also varies to some extent across the urban population and the rural population. And another question that I have related to this is that if we look at the distribution of the income, say the poor segment of the, the population, the poor households, maybe some of them in rural areas or not, how this varies? say the preference for boys, um, are they stronger uh, within the poorer households or the richer households, or whether there is any difference across sort of age groups, um, sort of the younger mothers and, and older mothers alike. Thanks. Thanks. Let's now turn to you, and if there is more time, we'll have another round. Okay, thanks for all the questions. Let me answer them in order. So the first point about the bride price, I think it's very important. And in fact, um, there is a paper in the JP by Wei and Zhang showing and uh, making this exact argument. They're saying that, you know, in areas where there are a lot of boys and very few girls, uh, parents anticipate that their sons will have to pay a lot to get a bride. And because of that, they save a lot more. So the empirical pattern they document is that in provinces where the sex ratio is more skewed, parent th the savings rate is higher. And particularly, the savings rate of parents with sons is higher. So I think that's sort of consistent with your gut instinct. And then um, this question about norms for younger cohorts I think that's, this is a really interesting question, right? What's gonna happen, and this is related but somewhat different from Carla's question about norms, so I'll answer them separately. So I think one question we can ask about cultural norms is if we have so few women, like where this, I'm also, I'm probably on the front end of the one child generation. There are so few women, 
how does that affect how we think our dynamics, you know, our intra-household dynamics, our social dynamics, and how does that change social norms? And I think it's hard to know which direction it'll go, and it could be different in the short run and the long run. So there is this, this, uh, there's a study about the cotton revolution that I mentioned about China. There's also this really nice study by um, Batar and Grosjean in the Review of Economic Studies. They look at Australian convict colonies, and they have really great data. And you know, the Australian convict colonies were almost all male, very few female convicts. And when they went, they were like highly desirable. Um, and what she showed is that in the beginning, this was great. In the short run, it was great for women. Women had really high rates of marriage. They were marrying up. Like you're a female convict, you can marry an officer. Um, you didn't have to work. Like everyone else is doing backbreaking labor. You can stay inside the home. You can, um, I mean, this is actually really good, right, to stay inside the home. They're having more kids, and uh, they have really high bargaining power and higher consumption. I mean, they're inferring bargaining power from consumption. But then she shows that in the long run, in the modern era, it's not so great, right? A part of it is that the context has, the benchmark has changed. These women still stay in the areas where there were more, convi uh, there were, in the areas where this was happening in Australia today, there's still, there's lower female labor supply. They're more likely to have attitudes that women should stay home and have kids. So all of those things, all of those um, beliefs that they got persisted over time. It's just that at the time those things were good, and now they're less good. So I think it's it's complicated. Um, but your hunch that this can affect and change cultural norms through various mechanisms, I think that's definitely right, and that's something we should spend a lot. <coughs> excuse me. That's a, that's something we should spend a lot of effort and time studying. It's worthwhile studying. Um, someone mentioned the household responsibility system and male birth, so thank you for mentioning that. So that's exactly right. That's entirely consistent with what I was saying, and I believe it. The household responsibility system it, um, made China more market-oriented, but that actually increased the gender wage gap, and that contributed to missing women. You know, I, I can't say that much about the South Korean experience. So demographers always mention South Korea and Taiwan. In fact, in Taiwan, also the sex ratios came back down, right? So you have these other Asian countries that had an explosion in terms of how skewed the sex balance was. And as it got richer, it got worse, it got worse. And then at some point, it got better. And it's not clear what happened, what drove it. I mean, probably a lot of different things. So um, part of it has to be cultural norms were changing. These were, it wasn't just economic change, right? These were societies that were undergoing massive social change. Part of it was that the economic structures were changing. You know, uh, so many things were changing. So I think what I get from that in terms of China is that I'm hopeful that things will get a lot better. In terms of policy, like what exactly should we do to make that happen, I think it's harder to know because so many things were happening at the same time. Um, so Carla, thank you very much for mentioning Lakshmi's study. Uh, I think I should have been more careful in choosing my words, which is that the traditional view of culture is that it's a very slow process and it changes very slowly. But the recent literature, uh, I think, shares your view and my view, which is that <coughs> culture can actually change quite quickly. And I think our goal as scholars and social scientists or policymakers is to figure out how to do that, right? And then there's lots of different ways. And I'm happy to brainstorm about different things that may or may not work in China. But um, I think this is really an open question and an important area for study, rather than something that we ha already have evidence on. Yeah. Uh, I'm almost done. There's only two more things. Oh, OK. So let me just um, finish, and we'll come back to that. Uh, so someone asked about the rural-urban differences. Yeah, so those are really interesting. Um, in the very beginning, we see sex imbalance only in urban areas where family planning policies was, were being rolled out. This is the 70s. And then we see a rise in sex imbalance in the rural areas in the early 80s because of uh, these market reforms. And then in the late 80s, we see a huge uptick in urban areas, that's not in rural areas, from sex selective abortion. And in the 90s, we see a huge uptick in the rural areas catching up with the urban areas. And this is from sex selective abortion being available everywhere. Um, 
I should know, but I don't have the answer of how rural and urban have kind of changed since the 90s. But I can look and I'll give, I can give you an answer <coughs> afterwards. And in terms of income and sex ratios across China, like just across regions today, you know, it's interesting. If you start, we don't see a huge difference, right, across uh, China today. Uh, in terms of income differences. And I think that's because those forces that we're talking about, they're sort of happening everywhere. Um, and I think it depends, this isn't, this isn't a, I'm not giving a very, satis I, re I appreciate that I'm not giving a very satisfactory answer. Um, but I think this will also illustrate the complexity of the problem. It depends on what you control for, right? And you have to decide, is it right to control? So when I look at the relationship between income and sex ratios, does it make sense to control for education? Because if I control for education, then I'm isolating the income effect. But if the main reason that income matters is through education, then it really doesn't make sense to control. So I think this is a topic, this is an important topic for a longer discussion. Um, and this is also what I meant at the very end when I said when we think about policy bundles, it needs to be very well thought out. We can't just take a study and say, oh, it shows this. It shows income matters, let's change income. It shows education matters, let's change education, right? We need to look really carefully at those regressions. What are they controlling for? What variation is being held constant? What variation is driving things? And then we need to map that onto policy because when we change policy, like, you know, what, what, like which piece are we moving? Are we moving only education without income? Are we moving income without education? Are we moving both? Like this mapping between research results and data and policy, I think it has to be done very, very carefully. So if anyone is talking to a policymaker and you want to include me in that conversation, I would be delighted. <laughs> so another round. Carla, you had a follow-up question, and then we'll come um, over. I wanted to respond to your remarks on how attitudes towards culture have changed a lot, that it used to be it takes forever to change it, and now it, now we recognize it doesn't. And um, obviously, I think we've got it right now, and we didn't have it right before. And I, I wanted to say that I think the reason we got it so wrong before is that we were wedded to the rational actor model of the decision maker. And the rational actor model can imagine everything and can see everything, and therefore his preferences will affect uh, absolutely what he wants over all choices. But once you see that the person has bounded rationality, then he's, he's thinking about a very small part of the world at any given moment. And if you can get him to think about a different part of the world, or if you can get him to imagine a different part of the world, his preferences can radically shift. So I think the big change that's driving our change in our attitude towards culture is recognition of bounded rationality. And I think it's a very disappointing thing in a lot of work, including fairly recent JEL papers on culture and economics, that they don't make this point, that they don't recognize that it's all a different world once we have bounded rationality. Thank you, Carla. I think there was a question there, and then we'll go. Yeah, please. Hi, uh, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I, my question relates to uh, the, the previous one that was raised, that's on the what uh, boys' family may be expected to contribute to girls' family. I recently learned that in China, um, it's now very common for boys' family to have uh, um, housing or the accommodation in cities ready sort of ready as a, almost a prerequisite for marriage. And uh, if you think about the Beijing or Shanghai real estate price, this is a huge financial burden for boys' family. I'm wondering if this has had any changes on the parents' preference, whether they want a boy or a girl in the more recent part of the China's history. Thank you. You had a question? Just wanted to follow up. Um, so would you agree that um, regarding policy options, it may be um, better to um, try to promote equal access to education for both boys and girls, and also um, 
try to improve parental education about um, gender preference, about gender equality in general. Um, compared to other policies such as subsidizing the cost of raising girls because those sound like more distortionary policy options. And also wanted to um, follow up on a previous comment about uh, Shanting Wei's paper upon the global savings club um, because of the, the higher cost of raising boys because of the uh, gender imbalance impact on the marriage market so um, parents may choose to save more just because it's more costly um, for their boys, uh, for their sons to be competitive on the marriage market. Please. Sorry, so what was the, well, I didn't understand the question. What was the last question? Um, the last question is that um, oh. these seem to go in opposite directions. So um, more recently, maybe the cost of raising boys are higher than raising girls. So wh what are the implications? Art? Mm. I had um, uh, two sort of comments slash questions. The one is, um, uh, I don't know if this is at all on the table, but it would seem that uh, a, a policy that would have a lot of signaling value is if, say, the state-provided pensions uh, discriminated based on the gender of your kid, right? So if you, you right? So if you have, if you only have a girl, no, no. If if you're an, a re retired person and you only have a girl, you get a, a bit larger a pension than if you have a boy, right, recognizing what the social norm for care is. And of course, people have to internalize that over a generation and think that that will persist for a generation. Uh, but as, as a signal, it might be something that's effective. The, the other question is, and I, I, I think it might have been implicit in a few of the comments before, but we have this sort of generation of, um, of scarce girls, is that the right, or scarce women, um, who are now becoming parents themselves, and I think it's, eminently plausible that their attitudes are going to be very different, uh, it's completely separate from their economic conditions, but just they know that they are scarce women and maybe don't want this to happen. I don't know if you could test for that at all. So is there, um, is there variation in the timing of sort of scarcity of, you know, when, when sex selective abortion sets in, you know, 20, 25 years ago that you could use to see whether, you know, there's a difference between sort of scarce women becoming parents versus non-scarce women becoming parents. Um, Thank you. So let me take the last question there. Um, this might be more of a comment uh, because you did talk about policy. Um, and a few years ago uh, when I was working as a, um, a poverty economist in Armenia, uh, where this is a problem actually that uh, the, the, skew, the sex ratio of birth became be, uh, skewed after uh, independence from the, the Soviets, right? So after the disintegration of the Soviet Union. And the, the, there was a lot of discussion around what should we do. Um, and because of that, we ended up doing a, a sort of a scan of the literature, looking at the policies that have been tried. So as you said, banning technology, basically access to technology just doesn't seem to do much. It's hard to implement. And whatever evidence we have, at least from India, India just doesn't seem to make any difference. Um, and one of the policies that was discussed and, was, and seemed quite attractive was also subsidizing the cost of having a girl. Um, and one of those, again, India is, uh, you know, it's like a, literally a lab of all these ideas being tested. Um, and there are states in India that tried to introduce these conditional cash transfers, if mm -hmm. you will, where mm -hmm. you got, you know, the mother got something and then the family got, um, uh, a, a, a certain amount of cash if they went ahead and had, had that baby girl. Um, again, whatever papers are available, um, you know, whatever research has been done, I've also looked at it myself. We don't really see these programs having an impact, uh, at least on the indicators we're looking at. Uh, so, I mean, we ended up with that scan of literature concluding that we really don't know enough and that mm -hmm. it really is about changing the fundamentals because uh, Trying to change attitudes because of scarcity of girls is a very costly way of getting there, so we definitely need to act sooner. Um, uh, but it does seem to be uh, much more about the fundamentals than sort of uh, about tackling the, the, the sort of the symptoms um, of, of uh, skewed sex issues at birth. Thank you. So let's turn to you for the last couple of minutes uh, for a few comments, responses. Okay, so um, I'll go out of order. So the last, I think that was a comment and I agree with you. 
Yeah, I agree that I think um, at the end of the day, I think all this discussion that we are having about, you know, like right now about culture and norms, I think, you know, people who have studied this problem, we sort of all agree that to kind of root out the problem, you need to get at the roots. And then, so part of the trick is to figure out how cultural norms are interacting with these different forces. So there's a, there are some quick fixes. And then um, another part of the question is to figure out how to change the cultural norms, right? This is like the root of the problem. And then, uh, which, you know, there might be an economic explanation also. I'm not like ruling out economics, but. Um, okay, so the a couple of people mentioned this issue of um, bride prices and whether the fact that boys' ha families have to buy apartments and the increase in real estate prices will change the preference for boys. Um, I guess there's a couple of ways of looking at it. One is, uh, so we don't have rigorous empirical evidence, and this seems like a study that's waiting to be done um, to see how the real estate price shocks interacted with this thing of men, the men having to provide a home is going to affect sex ratios. But you know, descriptively, we don't really, we don't see, we don't see sex ratios going down in cities uh, where real estate prices are spiking up, right? And my guess is that there's just a lot of other stuff going into the decision other than just real estate prices. And in fact, another way of looking at it is that, um, you know, like in the Shenzhen Wei paper, he shows that, um, yeah, he, he shows a positive association between real estate prices and more boys. The question is, like, which way does the causality go? I don't have a great answer for that. Um, is equal access to education and educating parents about equality of boys and girls a good idea? Um, I'm sure that's a good idea. I don't think anyone would argue that's a good idea. Is it less distortionary than other policies? I think that's hard to know. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. It depends on how you model the question. But I'm sure education is a good idea. I mean, not I'm sure. It, seem, it would seem that all the evidence suggests that equal opportunity to education and educating parents about gender norms is a good idea. Um, I've never heard of anyone thinking about tying pensions to the gender of their children. Um, not to say that they haven't. This isn't something that I know that much about. Uh, I, but I think you're right that you know for that to work, parents would need a lot of force, a lot of a lot of commitment has to be true, right, for that to work. The government has to be able to commit to some valuable amount of pension in the future, and the parents have to have you know a lot of foresight and be very rational. Not to say that can't happen, but I think you're exactly right in thinking about what has to be true for that to work. Um, and can we test the effect of female scarcity using regional and time variation? I think it's hard um, because I think it's hard because family because family planning was the policies that I talked about, like household responsibility system, the price reform, and family planning. These are one of the, these are some of the very very few policies in China that was rolled out almost at the same time across the country. For almost every other policy that supposedly is rolled out at the same time, actually there's a lot of time and regional variation. But these are the couple of policies that actually were rolled out, which makes it a little bit hard. Um, yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. This concludes our talk. Thank you. Please join me again. Thank you. Thank you.